there's no sound
wrapped around your finger I don't care, I wanna let this feeling linger I wouldn't step twice into the same old river Yeah, I'm happy where I am Keeps calling, and I've been chasing early to get me the coffee in the morning, a kiss when she leave me to get my day started. So I breathe in life and get to another rhythm, then I'm in the flow, sitting in the back line, waiting for the perfect one. And the waves came, washed over me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the waves came, washed over me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this Maybe I've been stalling Baby, I just want curvy Just to keep it in your pocket Kisses when she needs me Loving in the locket I wanna be water, skimming rock to my soul again. Pebbles on Long Beach, slowly turning into sand. And the waves came, washed over me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the waves came, washed over me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Pulls me out into the deep. It's 
surrounds me, holds me, falls when I breathe. But the air is clear and I am here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been searching for your love Only to find it's been staring Good morning, I'm Nick Curtin, Head of Business Development at Ford Asset Management. Thank you for joining us, as always, it's good to have your company. We appreciate you giving up the time. The mind of the manager really is about trying to give you, the investors, um, and your clients uh, a deeper understanding in terms of how we think about investing and how we go about managing the funds that, that your clients are invested in. And the focus today is on the two Ford Global Funds run out of our Singapore office, the Ford Global Equity Fund and the Ford International Fund. And they really are an important part of our, our product range. Um, if you're invested in any of multi-asset Ford portfolios, the Flexible Fund, the Balanced Fund, the conservative funds and egg group stable, a significant part of those assets is allocated to the international funds in various degrees. And they've really been putting on some pretty good runs in recent times. So we thought it's worthwhile uh, spending some time focusing on them. Many of you will be invested directly into one or a combination of the two. They work independently, but they certainly work very well together. That's how we use them in our multi-asset portfolios. Um, so we think it's relevant to, to spend a bit of time um, um, going into them. I think it's also important to us to emphasize that Ford really does have a global multi-asset class holistic investment capability. The world has become a small place and we think to deliver on the outcomes and the investment promises we've made to you, we think that that is essential and it's something we've spent a lot of time uh, building up. So hopefully you can get some, some flavor of that today. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Ishwith Hassan and Brian Arcees, two, two portfolio managers uh, from our Singapore office. They both are part of the multi, multi councillor uh, portfolio a manager range on the Ford Global Equity Fund, uh, and Brian manages a, a part of the Ford International Fund along with Dave Ford. Um, two very different products, and we're gonna spend a little bit of time on that um, um, today. So one of the things Ishrith's gonna unpack when he talks about the Global Equity Fund is he's gonna address the question of what is value. Very topical at the moment, there's a lot of commentary and analysis around value versus growth and the gap, et cetera. Most of which we think is rather superficial and not necessarily that, that helpful. Um, we certainly have a more nuanced view on what is value, and that's what uh, Ishrit's going to spend a bit of time talking to using uh, various examples uh, from recent times, and we'll, we'll come back to, to that later on in the summary. We'll then hand over to Brian, who's going to talk to the Ford International Fund, which has a quite different objective, and uh, obviously multi-asset class, absolute return, looks very different to the Global Equity Fund. Same team, same research, uh, same process, uh, but very different looking portfolio, and, and we'll explain the similarities and differences uh, and, and why it, it looks the way it looks the way it does. Brian's also going to be talking a little bit about risk. Um, we often hear the pundits on TV talking about risk on and risk off. Um, we don't think that there is any such thing as risk off. Risk is always there. As we always say, it's what, it's what can happen, not necessarily what will happen. Uh, so Brian's going to spend a bit of time talking to that. Um, please, as usual, as we go through the session, uh, use the Q&A um, uh, section to post your questions. We will have about 10, 15 minutes at the end of the session to address those. Uh, those which we can't get to, uh, we will answer in written form um, post the event. So, so please fire away, it's a great opportunity to pick Brian and Ishrith's uh, brains. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand across to, to Ishrith. Thank you, Nick. Hello everyone, I'm Ishrith Hassan and I'm one of the multi councillors of the Ford Global Equity Fund along with Brian Assis, Dave Ford and JC Sue. Thank you very much for joining us today on this online forum. And I do hope that we get to do this in person the next time around. 
I think most of you are aware of Ford's uh, long-term earnings and fundamentals focused investment philosophy. So today, I'd like to take you one layer deeper into the type of investors we are and how we identify opportunities regardless of the type of environment that we're in. So as a team, we're always trying to buy and own businesses that are priced at less than what they're truly worth, which is uh, broadly speaking, value investing. However, I wouldn't necessarily categorize ourselves as value investors in the traditional sense that we only buy stocks with low PEs or stocks that trade at a significant discount to the liquidation value of their assets, uh, which is an asset class that has meaningfully underperformed in the past few years. For us, value investing is a very broad church. We tend to find value in undervalued assets, which may or may not be of high quality as defined by the returns they generate, or we find value in very high quality compounding growth businesses that may appear very pricey at first glance, but present great value to us based on how much runway these businesses have to deploy capital at very high rates of return over a very long time. So I'd like to spend the bulk of this presentation walking through several examples across this value spectrum and peel the onion a bit on our process and how we identify opportunities. But first, let's start with examining the outcome of our efforts along this path over the past few years. As is evident on this slide, you can see how our performance has been improving gradually over the past seven years as this team has come together along with our portfolio construction and stock picking. Each year, um, not only has our performance improved as we've grown more comfortable with each other and our collective process, but it's also worth noting that the quality of performance has also improved. For example, if you take the last two years, it's worth considering how the portfolio behaved in the 12 months going into the depths of the COVID sell-off and the past year and a bit coming out of it. What you can see is that our stock selection worked not just in a strengthening market, but also in a weakening market. And underlying all this is, of course, our approach to stock selection uh, that I alluded to earlier. Our focus is always on understanding where a business is going to be in the future and trying to buy that business at a substantial discount to that future value to not only deliver us a, a sufficient return, but also adequate margin of safety on the risk of losing money. It's not just about being right, but being right for the right reasons that make a strategy sustainable. With that, uh, let me walk you through some of the portfolio changes we've made in the past 12 months and the reasons behind some of these changes to see how we stacked up. So as the pandemic hit the travel and hospitality sectors last year, we went about combing through the entire industry from aerospace to travel to transport and hospitality to identify businesses that were not just mispriced, but were special in that they were on a trajectory that was inevitable that would lead to highly certain earnings outcomes over the long term. In essence, we wanted to find businesses that would do well, regardless of how things evolved with the pandemic. So we started our search with our holding in booking.com, which we owned prior to the pandemic. This gave us great insights into the entire hospitality value chain. And as we dissected the various players within it, we noticed an unusual standout in extended stay Americas. So Extended Stay is the largest long-term stay hospitality business in the United States. That's basically a hotel catering to stays longer than seven nights. And what was unusual about this business is that they generated less than 20% of their bookings from online travel agents like Booking.com, which meant that their margins and returns were amongst the highest in the industry. To put that into context, uh, most similarly sized hotel chains generate more than double that proportion of bookings from OTAs, which significantly reduces their bargaining power within the value chain. We also found that stays occupancy levels and revenue per available room, or REVPA as it's known in the industry, was holding up phenomenally better than every other hospitality business in the country. So even during the depths of COVID in April 2020, Stay's revenue fell just 35% versus a, a massive 80% uh, for the rest of the industry. And the occupancy level stayed above 60%, while the rest of the industry tumbled to below 15%, which was a massive outperformance. 
Now, part of this was due to their extremely low uh, daily pricing, and part of it was due to the fact that their hotels were more like apartments and included uh, kitchen and laundry facilities, which was ideally suited for a lockdown world. But what we also found was that the company was very asset heavy because they owned all the real estate of their hotels, which is very unusual in the hospitality industry today. Since more than a decade ago, all the major hotel chains realized that they could operate a franchise model and be far more profitable without the burden of owning uh, their own real estate. And extended stay was just at the very infancy of embarking on this asset light journey, which meant there was a lot more upside going forward. But despite all these characteristics, uh, the stock had fallen almost 50% in the preceding 12 months, catalyzed, of course, by COVID, even though the business was improving and gaining share quite dramatically during COVID. We also realized that if we stripped out the value of the company's real estate, the business was trading at more than a 60% discount to what it was worth if it was liquidated then and there. We understood that if the pandemic continued, the business would continue to gain share given their price and value proposition. And if the pandemic stopped, the business would also recover rapidly as occupancy filled up with pent up demand. It was a, a truly unique and wonderful case of heads I win big and tails I still win, uh, but maybe not as big. And uh, I, I would mention that this type of asymmetric risk, risk reward is a recurring characteristic you'll find across many of the businesses we own. Anyway, uh, as the pandemic progressed, Stay continued to outperform every other company in the sector and management started to unlock value through real estate sales, um, which made the quality of the business and assets apparent to the market as well. But just as this value unlock was really starting to take hold earlier this year, as luck would have it, uh, Blackstone and Starwood, who are two of the smartest and most sophisticated real estate and hospitality investors globally, offered to buy out the entire business. Now, unfortunately, they want to acquire the assets at a price significantly lower than their true worth, even though it's still a massive premium to our cost base. But regardless, it was nice to receive uh, this validation from the market on our framework so quickly. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just about being right, but being right for the right reasons that gives us some degree of satisfaction. Now, that was an example of a true deep value type investment where regardless of what happened, the assets of the business alone were worth significantly more than the stock price we paid at the time. But in combing through the rest of the travel sector, we also came across a very different type of business in Haikoko. Haiko is one of those wonderful businesses run by the extremely capable Mendelssohn family, a father and two sons who are probably among the best capital allocators in the world today. Their track record of compounding cash flows at a very consistent 23% annual rate is better than even Buffett, uh, although over a shorter time period because they only took over the company in uh, 2001. But what is important is that they have the ability to continue to maintain those returns for decades to come. Now, how we came across Heiko was partly through a deep dive into our shareholding in Airbus. As we dug into the entire aerospace value chain, what we realized is that original equipment makers like Honeywell, Pratt & Whitney, Saffron, uh, were really gouging their customers on pricing for replacement parts. Why? Simply because they could, and the airlines had no other choice but to buy from them. The Mandelsons saw this in the early 90s and decided to make generic parts that were 30 to 50% cheaper than the original parts, and in most cases, better in quality because the original parts were developed decades ago, and Heiko was re-engineering them from scratch for modern times. The barriers to entry in this industry are extremely high because each part requires approval from the FAA, which is very difficult to obtain. Heiko just happened to be at the right place at the right time uh, with the right approach to gain a very strong foothold into the market, but there are virtually no newcomers into the industry today. And once the Mendelssohn's understood how to work with the FAA, they went from one aircraft part to another to eventually become the largest replacement parts maker for the aerospace industry over a span of 20 years. Each year, they take all the cash flows they generate and reallocate that to acquiring new capabilities, new expertise, and new parts to continue gaining market share. And this virtuous cycle continues to this day and will likely continue for many more years to come.
But what's incredible is that even though, uh, even with all that they've achieved thus far, Ico still only has less than 2% market share of the replacement parts market, which gives you a sense for how much white space is ahead of them to keep compounding for decades to come. Another thing we really liked about the business is that it was 22% owned by management uh, who uh, were completely aligned with shareholders. And their focus was simply on allocating capital at these very high rates of returns, which is exactly what shareholders need for the stock to work for them. So given all this, we realized that Heiko, just like extended stay, would be a beneficiary in an aviation industry looking to cut costs and tighten their belts. In every crisis that hit the airline industry, including the 08 crisis and 9-11, Heiko emerged stronger than before, and our view was that this time would be no different. This became very clear to us in how management behaved, uh, was behaving during the depths of the crisis last year, when all of the other aerospace parts companies were saddled with debt and cutting back on capacity, the Mandelsons, who had a net cash balance sheet, were greedily scouring the market for as many acquisitions as they could possibly snap up. So this was really a case of a wonderful business with an exceptional management team that should have substantially higher market share and earnings uh, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. The business had never been cheap uh, in the traditional sense. But with COVID, the stock fell 50% uh, with their peers who were very different to them, uh, which didn't really make much sense to us given the quality of the business. The stock was still pricey compared to everything else in the space, but presented great value to us over the long term. Ico fell into that uh, bucket of businesses where their long term market position, growth, and earnings was simply quote unquote inevitable. And against those long term inevitabilities, the stock was actually quite cheap. Now, it's also worth noting that these decisions were made before the vaccine breakthroughs happened last year, so there was still a lot of uncertainty in there at the time. Next, uh, I also wanted to quickly touch on a few other instances where the team's knowledge has been compounding over the years, which has led us to finding value and alpha in adjacent stocks or markets. As this table illustrates, our position in FMC led us to finding value in Corteva, which was a similar ag seed and chemicals company that was trading at a 30 to 40 percent discount to FMC. And we switched a part of our FMC position into Corteva, which led to one outperforming the other by more than 50 percent in the past 12 months. At the same time, four years ago, our position in Alibaba led us to identifying value in JD, which was growing faster and gaining share from Alibaba at the time and had lots of latent value in their in-house logistics network. This switch led to close to a 200% performance disparity between the two over the past two years. And what's amazing is that more recently, uh, JD has led us full circle back to Alibaba, where the stock has really gone nowhere, but the story has now changed and Baba receives no credit for the intrinsic value of its blossoming cloud computing business, which is already the third largest globally behind Amazon and Microsoft. And in Amazon and Microsoft's case, uh, those businesses are valued at a massive premium, whereas uh, in Alibaba's case, at the current stock price, we're essentially getting the cloud computing business for free. Another similar example was our switch from First Majestic Silver to Pan American Silver for very similar reasons. Our recognition of intrinsic value in one stock and sector leads us to bargains in another part of the value chain. It's like a gift that keeps on giving, which hopefully should continue across more industries and sectors as this team becomes more experienced with time. Lastly, I wanted to touch on how where we find value has also evolved over time. When this team first came together almost seven years ago, we found a lot of value in Europe and Asia. But as this chart shows, as a lot of that value was unlocked, where we found value has also evolved. During the depths of the pandemic, for example, as our Chinese stocks outperformed, we recycled some of those profits into the US, where we found pockets of value, like the ones I mentioned, which is reflected in how our geographic positioning has shifted as well. Now, these are just a few examples I wanted to highlight that illustrates how the team thinks about value and what has truly been behind uh, improving performance over the years. 
It's the maturing of this team and our collective process in identifying high co conviction opportunities globally that will enable us to continue to perform. Not all our stocks will work all the time at every stage of the cycle, but if we've done our jobs right, the portfolio as a whole should outperform over the long term. We may make some mistakes along the way as we have over the years, but our learning process is never ending and our mission will always be to achieve the best risk adjusted returns for our investors. And with that, uh, once again, thank you for taking the time to join us today. And I'll hand the screen back over to Nick. Thank you, Ishrit, for those very interesting insights. So valuable growth, well, we like both, but I guess we never compromise on the quality factors. Those always have to be there. I guess to summarize, if you think about the drivers of shareholder returns is some combination of uh, price paid, so PE multiple often referred to as a, as a rating, um, earnings growth and related to that dividends. Um, some investment opportunities, most of the return will come from a, a PE re-rating, so you buy something that's disconnected from its fundamental value, more of the traditional value play, and you get a, a market rating, re-rating up uh, in the share price. Um, others, the rating you pay is less relevant because you hold it for a very long time period and, uh, and, and you collect on the earnings and dividends over time and that becomes a bigger contributor to return. So there's neither better nor worse. We, we like both and we like to have um, diversified sources of, of returns in the portfolio. Um, so that's, a, I, I think, a tidy summary. We're going to move across to the Ford International Fund now. I'm going to hand over to, to Brian. Uh, the Ford International Fund uh, is... A different animal has quite a different objective to the global equity fund. Brian's going to unpack that a little bit more. Uh, very importantly, we'll have a that has had and will have a very different shape of return uh, to typical equity portfolios. Uh, much bigger focus on risk, uh, but Brian's going to unpack that and uh, and we'll circle circle back um, following that. So over to you, Brian. Great, thank you, Nick, uh, and hi everyone. I'm Brian Arcis, as Nick mentioned, portfolio manager uh, with Ishrith on the Ford Global Equity Fund. Uh, along with JC and Dave, and then with Dave on the International Fund. Six months ago, when we were chatting in the same format, I was optimistic that the next time we were going to speak together, we'd be able to do it in person. Obviously, my optimism was a bit naive, um, but hopefully we get to chat together in person very soon. Uh, and again, I am very appreciative of everyone tuning in, certainly all the familiar names that I see uh, that have RS RSVP today. Just to outline the agenda of what I'd like to cover, there are sort of three main points. One is really going back to the beginning and the basics of FIT, talking about the objective, uh, what we're trying to accomplish, how we accomplish that, why we believe it's important, uh, and, and what that's led to in performance over the short, medium, and long term. The second piece is to highlight the asset allocation changes over the past 12 months, given how eventful markets have been, uh, and also talk about the current asset allocation. And then finally, as Nick mentioned, end up talking about some of the risks that we see in the market currently. But maybe first, to start on the objective, when Dave uh, asked me to manage FIT alongside of him about seven years ago, he stated that we had kind of two main objectives in managing and delivering returns for investors in this fund. One was not losing investor capital, and another uh, was generating meaningful returns ahead of inflation through an investment cycle. Now, it wasn't happenstance how he ordered those two, and certainly the first one, being not losing investor capital, is paramount to us. And that comes through in how we manage the fund in a conservative way. But what does that mean uh, in practice, and what does that mean for results over time? Now, certainly a conservatively managed fund, uh, it's all well and good to say that a multi-asset class fund that's conservatively managed will outperform equities in down markets, for example, and that's where it earns its stripes and it will underperform the equity market in particular in up markets. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. So I wanted to put together three graphs to kind of best demonstrate not only how we manage the product, um, but, but what that has resulted in over time. So the first one here, uh, is just a simple three-line graph, and just to orient you a bit, the light blue line is inflation plus 500 basis points annually. The orange line is the cumulative performance of the international fund, and the black line, the cumulative performance of global equities. Sort of three points that I wanted to highlight on this graph in particular. 
The first was that this inflation plus 500 basis point light blue line, you can see here how uh, difficult it is to generate a 5% real return over time. So since the inception of the international fund, you'll see that that 5% real return really eclipses uh, even global equity markets through the period. The second piece I wanted to highlight uh, was a testament to how we manage the fund in a conservative way. So if you look over the full 24 year period, you'll see for much of the time, the orange line, which is the international fund, is either in line with or slightly above the inflation plus 5% hurdle. In the recent three years, you'll see that that, that has started to lag, uh, that inflation plus 5% plus hurdle. Now, I wanted to focus on that time period a bit, not because uh, I feel like we need to justify performance below that hurdle. Um, I think that we've actually done quite well, but that in this low rate environment, it's more of an example of how we manage the fund. So as rates have gone from, if you take the 10 year for an example, three and a half percent down to 40 basis points, obviously real returns have become harder and harder to achieve. Now, our default, as I mentioned, is to always protect investor capital. So we aren't going far out on the risk spectrum in order just to achieve what we have as our aspirational benchmark. And I think that's important to highlight. The, the last piece that I wanted to highlight on this chart is also the, how the fund performs in up and down markets, as I mentioned, uh, but how important downside protection is. So if you go all the way to the left hand side, you look at the inception of the fund in the late 90s. Now, the inception of the fund took place right during the run-up to the tech bubble, which is an interesting time to launch a conservative multi-asset class product. It can be a fantastic time or an unfortunate time, depending on how you look at it. But if you look at the first three years uh, from inception to the peak of the tech bubble, despite global equities not being our benchmark, uh, equities were up 83% over the period, while the fund was up only 20%. So lagging 60%. Uh, on a cumulative basis over that three year period. Now, obviously you see with the bursting of the tech bubble, the fund really held its ground uh, and even gained 11% as equities corrected 41% from top to bottom. But the more interesting piece of the story is to look how long it, it took the global equity market to again, catch up to the international fund, given how important downside protection is to generating long-term returns in a conservative manner. So if you move from left to right, you'll see that global equities didn't actually catch up to international fund again until 2019, which is a full 17 years later. Uh, and that was following an 11 year bull market, uh, which was one of the longest, if not the longest in history. Now, if I fast forward to today and flip to the next graph, I wanted to sort of look at this in a more recent context. So this is the same graph, but a five year period uh, leading into and, in, and then including uh, the pandemic. So the five years with ending 31 December 2019, you'll see the same. So obviously, if we extend this back, uh, the market bottomed in 2009. This is the culmination of, of what was also uh, quite a lengthy bull market. But in this five year period, you'll see that at the end, the cumulative return of equities again was about 20% higher on an absolute basis than the international fund. Now, if we add one quarter to this, which I've done on the next graph, and it's important to highlight here that we're not rolling anything off the backs. So we're not rolling off a period of underperformance relative to equities off the back, but simply adding one quarter going forward. That quarter, obviously, as everyone is aware, the first quarter of 2020 was an incredibly difficult quarter for the market with the S&P correcting 20%. And you'll see that just by adding that one quarter, the performance of global equities and the national, international fund is again quite uh, close on top of each other. And what I wanted to highlight here is that with the international fund, what we're attempting to do is to deliver long-term returns meaningfully ahead of inflation, but with much lower volatility and lower risk. So if we look at the two metrics of volatility over the past 10 years, sort of see standard deviation of returns, as a measurement of volatility. And in the international fund, we have vol uh, standard deviation of returns about half of that of what you see in global equity markets. And similarly, downside capture, uh, or lack thereof in the case of the international fund, which is incredibly important to us in how we manage the product, is also about half of what you see in global equity markets. So the biggest downside 
quarter or max drawdown, uh, if you will, over the past 10 years in the international fund has been 11%. And the biggest drawdown on a quarterly basis in the global equity market has been 20%. But if we, if we look at that on a monthly basis, on rolling periods, on an annual basis, what we see is that over the history of the fund, the max drawdown has been about half or less of what we see in global equity markets. And for us, that's really driven a significant amount of the long-term return. Another piece that I want to highlight in the same regard, and this is sort of, I, I feel, the hidden benefits of investing in a conservative product like the International Fund. There's a company in the US by the name of Dalbar that looks at quantitatively uh, analyzing behavioral impact on investment returns. And so everyone on the call, uh, and certainly everyone in, at Ford, is acutely aware that during times of market stress and enhanced volatility, we're all fielding calls from anxious clients and doing what we can to convince them that the best course of action oftentimes is to stay invested and to ward off uh, their desire to trim or even exit the market. So what Dow Bar has suggested and has quantitatively uh, proven is that on average investors lose about two and a half percent a year relative to an equity benchmark, uh, given the decisions that they make. If we look at the first quarter of 2020 as an example, the S&P was down about 19 and a half percent, whereas the average equity investor was down 22%. And that difference is just in one quarter. The average asset allocation investor was down about 15%, and the international fund was down slightly less than 9%. And so in our minds, not only are we uh, delivering a return over the long term that is in line with markets and meaningfully ahead of inflation, but providing investors with an opportunity during those volatile times to actually stay invested in the market. And so they really earn the long-term returns uh, of being invested fully throughout uh, the long term. What I wanted to do um, is also highlight, as I mentioned, the changes in asset allocation that we've had in the fund over the past 12 months, given how volatile the period has been. Now, certainly, we all remember uh, what was happening in the first quarter of 2020. But just to sort of take a step back and walk through how different the economic and uh, backdrop and landscape is from then to today, uh, a year ago, we would have been talking about unemployment in sort of the 12% to mid-teens range in the US. Today, the unemployment rate sits at 6%, and when the new number comes out on Friday, it may well be in the fives. Uh, GDP was declining at an annualized rate of 30% a, uh, a year ago. And today, GDP is growing at an annualized rate of 10%. And then finally, if we look at inflation, CPI was growing only at 0.5% on a year over year basis 12 months ago. Today, it's growing at 2.6% and accelerating. Now, we can chat later about whether that's transitory or structural, but certainly the backdrop is very different than it was 12 months ago. So, as we've chatted about previously, the asset allocation in the international fund is very dynamic. And that's the sense you'll get from this slide as well. So the largest moving pieces, and the two that I'll, I'll chat about here, equities and credit. On the equity side, we've added meaningfully to the equity exposure over that 12-month period. Equities exposure in the fund troughed at around 40% and now stands north of 70%. So meaningful change over that period, the majority of which was driven by uh, adding to either names that we currently uh, owned in the fund or already owned, or adding new names to the fund. And then also a portion was certainly driven by positive market returns. And then the other piece that I wanted to highlight here, the biggest changes would be the decrease both in the corporate credit exposure and the sovereign credit exposure. So late in 2018, when believe it or not, the US two year was trading with a yield of 2.75%, we took a meaningful position that position matured uh, a few months ago, and with the two-year now trading at 15 basis points, uh, in our mind, that's not enough of a yield to justify uh, the, either the risk or reason uh, to own sovereign credit. So we haven't rolled that position, and that's moved into cash. And then on the corporate credit side, as you know, we felt for some time that it's been difficult to justify owning corporate credits given where rates have stood. We did, however, 
uh, find and actually lead uh, a debt deal and a unique credit that was based here in Southeast Asia, a Cambodian casino company, by the way, of Nagacorp. And that was three years ago. That three-year paper was paying 9.325% in US dollars, which is quite a handsome return. And that also matures uh, in about two weeks. That yield is difficult to come by in the market. So again, that will likely roll from that corporate credit into cash. Now, if we look at the asset allocation today, you can see on the pie chart that, as I mentioned, equities is now slightly north of 70%. Despite lofty market valuations, uh, we still feel that equities are the most attractive asset class. The two other pieces that I want to highlight here are the commodity exposure, which you see here is close to 7%. But what's not shown here is the additional commodity exposure that comes through with our holdings in particular precious and industrial metal, metals miners that are in the equity bucket. So the true commodities exposure of the fund uh, is slightly more than double what's listed in the, the pure commodities bucket here. And then the other piece I wanted to highlight was the absence of credit. As I mentioned on the previous slide, that's been uh, the biggest change to the downside exiting both the treasury uh, that we held previously and then in the next few weeks exiting the corporate credit that we have. Now, as I mentioned, it is quite difficult to find credits where we feel rates justify uh, the risk. We do own, however, and I want to highlight some credit like equities in the portfolio. Now, if you look at the equity buckets uh, within international fund and global equity, there is certainly overlap between the two. But it's absolutely not uh, the case that all of the equities in the global equity are held in the international fund. So two I wanted to highlight here are both in our top three in the inter international fund. Uh, and the first is SSE, which is Scottish and Southern. It's a fully regulated, uh, integrated utility based in the UK with 95% of the business from uh, Britain itself and another 5% from Ireland. Half of the business is in regulated networks and another quarter is in renewables. The management team has done an excellent job over the past sort of seven to 10 years, repositioning the portfolio from fossil fuel generation to renewables. The stock offers a 5.5% dividend yield, uh, but it's also inflation linked, which is incredibly attractive and something that we wouldn't find either the yield or the inflation link uh, for that yield in a credit itself. The stock is not highly correlated with the market with a beta of less than 0.5 and has generated stable returns of 7.5% annually for the 10 plus years that we've invested in the company. So this is an example of a credit-like equity uh, where we're not comfortable holding debt itself, but we are able to find quite exciting um, equities that mimic similar properties and deliver better returns. The other name that I wanted to highlight was Nestle. So Nestle is the largest packaged food company in the world, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. $85 billion a year in revenue and a market cap of $300 billion. The company has over 20 brands that do in excess of a billion dollars a year in sales, including KitKat, which you'll see uh, these two are enjoying on this current slide. Now, the stock offers a 2.5% yield, so it's not exactly a credit-like equity, but management has done a fantastic job with incremental innovation um, and capital allocation to continue to grow the portfolio despite its already large size. So the 2.5% dividend yield is incredibly stable, as is the equity itself. And with the growth that management generates, the stock has returned 10.5% annually over the 10 plus years that we've owned it as well, in excess of market returns over that period. And again, this is a company that also has a relatively low correlation to the market with a beta of less than 0 0.5. And so those are just two examples of companies that we own uh, in the international fund, but not in global equity that aid in, in the generation of those long-term returns. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the third point and final point on the agenda that I wanted to highlight was just to chat through some of the risks that we see in the market currently. Now, this list is certainly not exhaustive. And as Nick's, Nick mentioned earlier, um, we're not forecasting whether or not uh, in a binary way these risks occur. But more importantly, 
trying to articulate um, and triangulate uh, what's the probability of the risk occurring and what is the magnitude of the impact and the positioning the portfolio around that. So the first one I would highlight is inflation. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of debate currently around whether this increase in inflation, which is certainly happening, is transitory or structural. Now, we obviously have uh, positions in the portfolio uh, to benefit if inflation continues to run or even accelerates from here. Uh, but the companies that we own are, would also do quite well if inflation was transitory. The second one are COVID variants, uh, which aren't obviously company specific, but certainly would have a big impact on uh, the fundamentals of different economies globally. If variants emerge that are able to evade vaccines, which we certainly hope is not the case, then obviously that could set the world back in quite a meaningful way. And that is something that we have to take into account in portfolio construction. The third would be regulatory changes, particularly uh, for the technology sector. So prior to the change in the US administration, uh, European governments and others globally had talked about uh, increasing regulation and increasing tax uh, on global technology companies, which have obviously been the best performing on the three, five, and even 10 year view. With the change in the US administration, the US is also talking about additional regulation for these companies. And again, this isn't a zero one, um, but where on the spectrum does any ultimate regulation lie? That's certainly something that needs to be taken into account as well. And then finally, tax changes in the US. So the Biden administration has proposed close to $2 trillion in tax increases, both at the individual level and at the corporate level, with the current corporate proposal uh, increasing the tax rate from 21 to 28%. Now, as it stands, increasing that corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 as proposed would be about a 10% hit to the earnings of US corporates uh, or the earnings of the S&P next year, which would at least offset uh, the growth that we expect, if not more. Now with the market trading at close to 25 times earnings, even on a 2021 basis, if that full tax proposal were to be implemented, uh, the market would be expensive not only in the current year, uh, but for 2022 and possibly 2023 as well. And so where the ultimate tax rate ends up is also something that needs to be taken into account. So just to conclude, uh, I'd like to, to reiterate and highlight again that we're with the International Fund uh, doing our best to build an all weather portfolio. Um, we take these risks into account, and as Nick mentioned, not risk on or risk off, uh, but in evaluating the probability and the magnitude and building a portfolio accordingly. So with the International Fund, um, it dovetails quite nicely with global equity, uh, and we're very, um, we're very happy and, and uh, excited to chat to you about it today. And I'm excited to, to continue to work hard to deliver those inflation beating returns over the long term. So thank you, Nick. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, always interesting. I think uh, you can see having looked at those numbers in the track record of the Ford International Fund and hearing Brian talk through, through how they run that portfolio, you can see why we do call it our flagship global fund. Um, if you're looking for the, the catch-all um, fire and forget, then, then that's the right portfolio for you. Um, as we said earlier, we do use them in combination. Many investors directly in, into those funds also tend to use both uh, to sort of calibrate their, their, their risk appetites. It's a, it's a very useful combination. So hopefully you've got some better insight in terms of, of how we think about investing, our investment style. We've spoken a lot about value today. Um, interestingly, it's, uh, I think it's something that, um, that Isha said that really stuck um, is to generate performance uh, you have to be right, but for it to be sustainable and repeatable, you have to be right for the right reasons. So hopefully we've given you some sense that, that that's the case uh, within, within Ford. Very interesting, in, interestingly, talking about style is when we have conversations with consultants, multi-managers, uh, DFMs, etc. cetera, it's, it's often a part of the discussion and the due diligence where we spend a large amount of time is, is trying to, to pin down sort of what Ford's style is. Um, it's not easily boxed. It doesn't really fit that well on a sort of two axis uh, spreadsheet. We think it's, it's more three dimensional than that. Um, and yeah, many of them will know that, that 
we will go where we need to go, obviously within the strict risk and quality parameters that, that, we, uh, that we don't compromise on. Um, but that often means that we are contrarian. So um, if you did a quantum analysis, the funds will sometimes look growthy, will sometimes look more value, uh, but always relatively high on, on quality factors, as I said earlier. Um, and often being contrarian means that you tend to, uh, we, we tend to often hit the straps um, when many of the others aren't. And obviously when you're combining managers, that's a, a reasonably attractive um, quality uh, to have. So the, the last point I wanted to make is we also talk a lot about being long-term investors, which we certainly think we are. Um, but that doesn't mean that you just stand still, um, quite, quite the opposite, uh, in fact. And I think that you should have picked that flavor up from both Ishrith uh, and Brian's um, um, comments. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at uh, the realities in long-term investing, that there's, no, there's no start line and there's, there's no finish line. So if you're looking at a five-year return number, for example, um, just remember nobody blew a whistle five years ago and there's nobody waving a, a checkered flag today. So... Um, as Brian demonstrated with, you know, bringing a quarter in and a quarter out, the pictures can change quite, quite quickly. Um, and what's really important is, is that, that long-term uh, shape of return um, that, that, that stays, uh, stays where it should be. Um, so we have to keep moving. We have to keep looking. Um, we go where we need to go. Um, as we like to, to say to ourselves uh, all the time internally is, uh, you know, we're only as good as our next investment idea. Um, and and I'll, I'll, leave it at, I'll leave it at that point and we can go over to, uh, to some questions and answers. So uh, the, the first one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send, uh, I think, Brian, you're probably best to, to start off on this one, is, um, is from Paul. Um, and he says, I think it is fair to say that equity markets would have been depressed at the moment. Was it not for the stimulus packages that are huge, huge and multiple in quantum compared to the GFC? How do you see this playing out? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And I mean, I think that's absolutely correct. Certainly, if you take the US as an example, um, the three and a half, sort of put a half COVID stimulus packages that have been put in place over the past 18 months total $5.7 trillion, which is about a third of GDP. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a massive amount of stimulus. In the absence of that, you would have had a significantly deeper recession. So I think from here, um, I mean, arguably, the last one passed along party lines with Republicans certainly feeling that it wasn't necessary and that the economy was ready to function uh, more or less on its own two feet uh, with the massive amount of the stimulus that had already been put forward. I mean, in our mind now, um, we, we don't see another uh, COVID stimulus package coming through. And even um, the amount of sort of infrastructure spending that, that the US may do from here on out is gonna be much more difficult to pass. But that being said, the underlying fundamentals of the economy are quite strong. If we look at housing, for example, uh, the trends are you know, as strong as they've ever been, um, but with no real reason for that to kind of fade here. So in our mind, the, the underlying economy at this point is actually quite strong. It's just dovetailing that with where valuations are, which are also quite expensive. Thanks, Brian. Uh, another question has come through um, asking about the views on physical gold. I know we've had the, we've had the gold ETF in place for some time, as well as um, uh, some of the some precious metals miners, the streamers, etc., uh, and then and then uh, I guess aligned to that is is just broad views on, on on resources more more generally. Sure, sure. Maybe I can take uh, the the gold piece in particular, and, and um, Ishrith maybe able to chat through some of the resources names that we own, uh, like Freeport, for example. Um, but but for gold, I mean, so so we own a portion of gold on the portfolio uh, and have for some time. We do view it both as a diversifier and an inflation hedge um, and have owned both physical gold as well as streamers, which certainly uh, benefited uh, from not only the gold price increase, but I think it's important to understand that even the miners that we own, and Ishwith can spend a minute or two kind of articulating this when he talks about one or two of them, that when we own a miner in the portfolio, it's not only because we feel that the underlying commodities that they may be mining uh, and in this, with the streamers, in this case gold, but also because the fundamentals of the company itself and, uh, are strong and that the management team is a strong management team. So obviously gold has underperformed uh, this year as real rates have 
uh, have backed up. But, uh, but in our mind, it's still, uh, it's even more attractively priced now uh, and will remain, at least at this point, with our views of inflation, uh, a core holding in the portfolio. Sure, and with the, with the companies uh, that we own, as Brian mentioned, uh, I think uh, with the businesses, what the, uh, the commodity business especially, uh, what we look for is businesses that would do well regardless of the commodity price. So uh, yeah, we're not trying to call the gold price or copper price three, five, seven years down the line, but uh, there are certain characteristics we look for in a business uh, where uh, going back to what I was talking about before, where we see uh, a certain inevitable trajectory in earnings uh, and uh, the direction that the business is going in that would allow us to generate a return regardless of what the commodity price uh, is. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, Brian mentioned uh, Wheaton uh, and Freeport. Uh, those are two, two stocks we own in the portfolio. We've actually owned them for uh, a couple of years now already. Uh, and uh, we own them in much bigger size before and they've, they've become a bit smaller as uh, uh, the stocks have worked for uh, those idiosyncratic reasons outside of the commodity price. And now, uh, as obviously you have uh, this big focus on inflation and, and you see the commodity prices also rising, they certainly benefit the, the stocks as well. And, and our view on management uh, and how they allocate capital going forward, given these commodity prices and this environment, uh, uh, gives us the confidence uh, and the view that they'll continue to compound earnings uh, going forward as well, which is why we still have uh, meaningful positions in them uh, even today. But, but yeah, broadly speaking, uh, we look for businesses that, that should do well, regardless of what happens to the commodity prices. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question, which I, I can answer from uh, Paul was just asking if the graphs that we're showing are uh, net or, or gross of costs and uh, all the numbers we've shown are, are after all costs. Um, so just to, to put that, that one away. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Brian, you sort of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, question from Charles, if rising inflation forces the Fed to hike rates, um, how does that impact global equity markets? And perhaps I'll add a little bit to that. I mean, how, maybe adding to that, how, how do we I sort of manage uh, the scenario risks, so to speak. Yeah, so I think in a rising environment, what you've seen, I've answered a couple of ways. Um, I mean, if you if you look at the the outperformance of some of the long duration names over the past um, sort of three, five, seven years, a significant portion of the outperformance has taken place uh, during a period of falling rates. So I, I, it's not unreasonable to expect that in a rising rate environment, you'll see some rotation out of long duration names, which would be primarily tech, but not exclusively, into some of the shorter duration areas. You've seen a lot of that already happen uh, from the bottom of rates November of last year, sort of present day, uh, or at least mid to late March uh, when, when the tenure sort of peaked. And so you'll you will see that rotation continue um, to the extent that rates continue to rise i think that it's important to take a step back and, and look at the impact of rates on the market as a whole and if we look historically if rates are rising at a fairly modest clip uh, and and if we look at the data quantitatively going back in time that's been sort of 30 35 basis points a month the equity market has actually done quite well. Uh, and and it's, it's also to be expected, given that generally rates are rising because the economy is doing better. Uh, it's, it's when rates rise rapidly uh, that it causes some indigestion in the market, uh, like the taper tantrum, for example. So it's our expectation that while you may get underlying rotation within the market, um, that in a rising rate environment, the market itself can do well. Now, obviously, at 25 times earnings, if we look exclusively at the U.S., uh, it's going to be, I'm not expecting um, robust returns, uh, but you're still likely to generate reasonable returns as the economy continues to do well. Thanks, Brian. Uh, one from Mark. Uh, please illustrate the geographical spread between, the, between global and international and your view on the relative impacts of uh, QE and bond buying uh, in the ECB, China and Japan. And then uh, related to that is if we see so-called sort of taper tantrums, which emerging markets uh, look, look vulnerable? 
Do you want me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. I'll start and then and then Ishit can can jump in. Um, so I guess I would say so. So the I forgot the first part of the question already, Nick. Sorry. <laughs> can you just remind me of the first part? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it was more about the just just uh, chat about geographical ah, the, the, spread. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so if you look at the spread um, of both portfolios, uh, because we're we're benchmark aware, but certainly not constructing portfolios to the benchmark, uh, we're finding more attractive names currently that are outside of the U.S. as we have uh, in the past as well. Though, as Ishwith mentioned, um, the names that we were adding during the pan pandemic happen to be located in the U.S. So sort of region agnostic, but if you look at the portfolio as a whole against the global equity benchmark, we would be underweight the US, uh, overweight Asia, in particular China, um, and more or less in line with, with Europe. And then if we look at sort of QE and bond buying globally, um, I mean, no doubt that it, it absolutely comforts investors <laughs> Um, and that additional liquidity helps the market. I, I think that, uh, I mean, you've seen Canada, which is obviously not a massive market, but start to pull back already. Um, the, the Fed has been uh, doing their best to not even hint at pulling back yet, but I think the economy is doing significantly better than even they expected it to do. Uh, unemployment is, is basically where the Fed expected it to be at the end of 2022. Uh, so it's not unlikely that they'll need to at least start walking back some of that language. Um, so you may see uh, a mini taper tantrum um, in the markets. And I think that, uh, I mean, emerging markets have certainly been aided by QE. And I think that uh, we're not necessarily, I wouldn't be nervous about our particular exposure uh, within China uh, and within some of the other emerging markets that we have, um, if if a taper tantrum were to occur, particularly on a mid to long term view, it, it wouldn't impact the underlying fundamentals. Yeah, and just to add to what Brian was saying on the uh, geographic uh, positioning, I mean, we, we are not really targeting any sort of uh, geographic split uh, per se, uh, we go uh, where we find value. And uh, if that means a certain weight uh, in a certain geography, so be it. Um, and uh, that's kind of how we look for opportunities uh, globally. And um, we are a global team, we cover all sectors. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, we just, uh, uh, the, the, the geographic split and positioning uh, in each of the funds would be uh, something that's a consequence of our research and process rather than rather than uh, something that we're targeting uh, with, with uh, any specific weight or anything like that. Uh, thanks, thanks guys. And then I, I guess we've got uh, uh, only a few minutes left. So, so perhaps this will be the last question. And you know, we, we, we always say that we, we big on sort of long-term themes and, and secular trends, et cetera. There's a question around whether we've done any, uh, any homework around the um, hydrogen as a, as a fuel source. Yeah, um, we've actually here yeah, we've done a fair bit of work on hydrogen. Uh, we we tend to love when there's a, a big transition or disruption in the market because that usually leads to uh, a fair bit of noise and and uh, misunderstandings on on valuation, on the growth trajectory, on the S curve of a new technology, on the disruption of the old guys. Uh, so that leads to usually lots of opportunity. Uh, both in the old guard as well as uh, the new disruptors. And uh, yeah, we, we, we recognized that last year as uh, the hype around hydrogen really started to take hold. Um, and we broke down the entire value chain as we, as we do with, with most industries. And um, I mean, what, what we found was that, I mean, there's, there's obviously this big inevitable trend that's going to take place uh, to clean energy and green energy over the next sort of few decades. Um, and there are, there's obviously a lot of innovation happening. Uh, it's driven by regulation as well. Um, and there are all these uh, businesses that, that cater to certain parts of the value chain, but uh, with hydrogen, 
uh, specifically uh, the 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 part of the value chain that's starting to move at least at this stage of the cycle are the commodity focused parts like the electrolysis makers or the solar panel uh, makers where it's uh, quite difficult to um, have a strong grasp on their earnings trajectory over the next at least the next five years uh, and not just that uh, the other part of it is valuation obviously which which it all has to uh, boil back down to uh, valuation levels uh, in in those uh, segments of the market are also quite extreme so i mean the electrolysis makers who are the most direct beneficiaries of a sort of hydrogen economy are trading at sort of 40 times sales uh, which uh, which is definitely uh, not a valuation that uh, that gets us very excited at least uh, at this stage i mean even i mean you see this across all types of disruptions as well including uh, the tech disruption uh, when the automobile was first uh, uh, invented i mean you had hundreds and hundreds of auto companies uh, 99 percent of them don't exist today and uh, so we're really trying to uh, find those businesses even within these big disruptions uh, that will be around and be generating strong earnings and cash flows 10 20 30 years down the line uh, and are priced reasonably uh, today uh, compared to uh, that trajectory. And we need to have the ability to take a strong view on, on that trajectory as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's a space that, that we've dissected quite, uh, quite diligently. We've looked at the TSOs, the gas transmission uh, pipeline companies. We've looked at the industrial gas players. We've looked at the electrolysis companies, we've looked at uh, the traditional energy companies and how their uh, uh, view is on this space and, and how they're tackling it. Um, but at the moment, uh, there's nothing that really excites us uh, from a long-term fundamentals and earnings standpoint. But, uh, and, and usually these types of disruptions happen in waves as well, even with uh, electric vehicles and even the internet, uh, you obviously see that big spike in the s curve and hype cycle at the very beginning and then as reality uh, disappoints against those hyped up expectations especially in an exuberant market like uh, you see today that's exuberant about everything already um, then you you see the, the the stock price catch up to the fundamentals and and fall as as you're seeing in lots of the hydrogen names already uh, you look at some of the electrolysis companies the fuel cell makers they've all sort of corrected quite a bit. And so as that happens, and as uh, the businesses become more uh, uh, stable and the strategy becomes clearer as well, uh, we'll be ready to pounce uh, given that uh, we do have uh, a watch list of, of businesses and, and uh, price levels at which they would be appealing to us. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's one of those things that, that we're watching very closely, but uh, haven't really pulled the trigger on just yet. Thank you. Um, not, not surprising. I, I guess that's um, as we would expect. You'd, you'd be all over that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I, we don't want to overstay our welcome. We've just gone past the hour. Um, so uh, Brian and Nishra, thank you very much for joining us today. More importantly, all of those of you that have uh, dialed in, thank you very much for the time. Um, it's always appreciated. Um, and uh, we hope you found some value. So until next time, goodbye. Searching for your love Only to find it's been staring right in front of me Right where I could see Sometimes life 
tastes just like a bitter pill Hard to swallow But easy when I'm full of you That's all right with you, it's fine by 